Okay, it looks like we've uh, seen the uh, a slow drip now and the people coming in, so we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Tracy Reagan. I am CEO of Deploy Hub, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is at the end. But I'm also a board member of the CD Foundation. I have the honor of being the board member, general member board um, representative. So you probably, you may have seen me over at the CD Foundation booth because as the general member rep, it gives, it gives you some extra work, which means being at shows like this and running the booth. Um, I've been in software configuration management my entire career, literally my entire career. So I'm a bit of a, a configuration management um, geek, and I know that sounds like an old term, but it's still a, 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 an important critical term, and we're gonna talk about why I believe it will be even more important in managing what we now are starting to call um, a Kubernetes or microservices Death Star. Uh, but, you know, it's not just about me, so while we have still some people uh, trickling in, there, are, there is an amazing amount of intelligence in this room, and this is about community. So if you would just turn around to somebody sitting next to you or behind you, introduce yourself, say where you work, so that it's, it's not just about me on this stage, it's about everybody in this room that's come to hear about pivoting from monolithic to microservices. Because we have a lot to learn and a lot to do, and the more you know, the better. And the more people you know who've done it, the better. So take a second and introduce yourself to a neighbor. Okay, I had a feeling you guys were gonna be the chatty bunch. It's pretty funny, as you guys were talking, people were straggling in there looking like they were coming into a rowdy classroom. <laughs> like, all the other rooms are quiet. So to, to, to start this discussion, let's start. When I, when I joined the board at the CD Foundation, one of the first um, roles that I took on was trying to define the CD landscape. And I discovered really fast that part of the problem is, is that we don't have a good definition of it, but the CD Foundation did it for us. So I put it up here because it's an important discussion to have because continuous delivery is not a particular tool. It's not Jenkins, it's not a Circle CI, it's not a, a JFrog, it's all of those things. And I think that what they, the, when the CD Foundation launched, um, I think that this is an important definition. They really talk about it as being an engineering approach in which teams produce software in short cycles, ensuring that the software can be reliably released at any time. It's not con just continuous build, it's not continuous test, it's just not continuous deploy, it's all of those things. Now I know all of you know this, but we're gonna go over it because it's going to change. We're gonna talk a little bit about what today's common practice looks like and what I'm predicting for the future. Now, I'm not gonna say that I'm gonna be correct. There are people who are doing microservices and we're really gonna shift the way in which we work around the, the CD pipeline when it comes to microservices. I've looked at the situation, I've talked to customers, I've talked to people that are using um, th this new platform, and these are the things that I'm hearing, and so it's, this is a, a, a basis for a discussion because this is new. Moving from a Kubernetes, uh, moving from a monolithic to a microservice-based architecture is drastically different. One of the big changes coming is the compile step. Um, right now, when we do monolithic uh, pipelines, we compile the entire package and we release the entire package. Now, we were told to move away from that. Um, Agile has taught us differently but we really never achieved it 100%. And what I mean by that is, yes, we run in smaller, we, we can do small sprints, and we do less coding changes, so a check-in causes a compile, and we might be able to release that, but we still are doing full monolithic builds and full monolithic releases. We still are managing it as a big, fat tarball kind of thing. And the one thing to keep in mind, and I, I should have highlighted this, and I almost missed it, is the bottom. Package configuration is done at build time. 
You know, you have some really, really smart buildmeister out there who's making sure that that compile is done. You have tools like Nexus and Artifactory that's tracking the library management, managing about your transitive dependencies, but you do it down at the development side. Um, and so when we do all that compiling, we figure all that out and we don't have to worry about it again later. For the most part, you might have a problem with a, the wrong version of your Java runtime, but that's probably going to be the, the, the extent of it. Um, and one workflow in general, you may have multiple versions of a workflow, but in general, one workflow, you have one repository with all your source code, you have one workflow pushing all that put through the process, um, and a release is, is sort of um, managed based on one big repository of code, a big compile, and a release, no matter how small the changes are inside of it. Um, it you know, in some of your CD implementations, I know that you, you'll create a new workflow for every release which is probably a, a fine practice. Not everybody does that. Uh, so you have multiple workflows, but this is going to even get bigger. We're going to explode the workflows. And we're still a bit waterfall. You know, we still have dev, test, and prod. And that probably is going to go away too. And that's my biggest prediction, is this is that waterfall, we're finally going to get rid of it. It's going to dry up, and there's not going to be a waterfall like this anymore not with the way we can use a service mesh in Kubernetes, and we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. So yeah, we figured all that out, and now it's all changing, which is a really good thing, actually. It's, this is a, a, a super exciting um, platform to be working on, and some of the issues that we've had with this waterfall process, uh, and really getting to an agile cadence where a change is really a change, and it really goes out independently, that's really coming. But in order for it to get here, we have to change the way in which we're doing our pipelines. So let's just talk, just to make sure we're on the same page, let's just kind of clarify what this new uh, modern architecture looks like. We have Kubernetes. Anybody, how many of you have uh, played on Kubernetes? I like KubeCuddle or awesome. I'd say mo most of half of you have out there. So you all know what, it, how many of you at least played with a Docker container, or run a Docker push, most of you. Um, and then there's microservices, and how many of you started doing microservices? Okay, so we're, we went from about you know, 50% to about 25%. So it's coming and it's not going to slow down. Um, I was talking at a, at a dinner earlier in this week to um, some folks uh, that work for a big airline and I said, have you moved to the cloud yet? And they were like, yeah, we're getting there, we're getting to the cloud. You know, we, we still have a big data center but we're still starting to move some stuff to the cloud. And I was like, well, what about you know, Kubernetes and microservices? And they're like, oh, we already started a whole pro a project around that. So I found it really fascinating that even though they hadn't moved to the cloud, they were moving to Kubernetes. So some companies may just bounce right over the cloud and go right into a Kubernetes microservice architecture. So if you haven't already, um, the more you read, the more you um, understand some of the challenges that are coming up. The, uh, Chris Richardson from Cloud Foundry has a, a website called microservices.io. I encourage you all to read. And this comes from um, his, these are quotes of his from that, that, uh, that page. So what is a microservice? I like to say think functions. Think functions, think functions, think functions. And think reuse. A microservice should be reusable at, um, at some level. I mean, there may be a hierarchy that a higher level uh, microservice doesn't get re reused by another team lower on the, um, the, the hierarchical chart, but for the most part, it should be reused. And a server should implement a small st set of strongly related functions. Services that change together should be packaged together. So instead of us thinking about our applications, now we're thinking about functions that can be reused by other applications. Um, a service can be changed without affecting uh, clients, and each team that owns one or more service must be autonomous, which means that we're going to be more siloed, so more collaboration is going to be required. And a team must be able to develop and deploy their services with minimal collaboration with other teams. So tooling around collaboration is going to become more and more critical because we're, we're going to actually silo ourselves even more because we're thinking functions. So the challenge one, um, because microservices are independently deployable, they should have their own repository and workflow. So how many of you are GitHub users? 
How many of you open up your repositories to all teams? Only a tiny number of you. OK, that's probably going to change. Because in the GitHub world, that's the ultimate in collaboration, right? And we always want to lock things down for good reason. So if you think about, there's a, uh, if you want to play on a microservices uh, application, there's something called the hipster store that you can play on. So I used the hipster store as my um, example in, in this uh, uh, presentation. So in, if you start breaking up your functions into um, strongly relatable um, areas, you're going to change the, you're going to decompose your application in a way you haven't seen before. So in the hipster store, they have a secure, they have a, they have a front end piece, they have a security piece, they, had a, they have a product catalog piece, they have a service piece, and they had like eight other pieces, but to be honest, I got lazy and didn't want to put them all up there. <laughs> it's like, well, this was enough. Um, and each one of those microservices in, in this world would have its own repo. And if you were the hipster store and you were going to create a millennial store as well, you may reuse the security repo and you may reuse the payment service repo and some of the other um, pieces. So that's one way that that's going to change. You're going to have multiple workflows. So in our old model, we have a single workflow for our monolithic and we may replicate that workflow for versions. In the new model, you're going to have multiple workflows for each uh, microservice grouping or each microservice, and you may have multiples of those. So you're going to expand su substantially the number of workflows that you're working on. Um, we did a, a survey and, and asked this particular question, but I'm just going to ask it here. How many of you that are doing microservices have sorted out that you want each microservice uh, to be in its own repo? And how many of you who are doing microservices decided not to do that? One person. So the, the general consensus, and I don't know if that's right or wrong, is that you're going to have multiple ones. So the other thing that we have to think about is where did our application go, right? We don't have a monolithic anymore. We just have microservices, and a collection of microservices makes up an application. So you're going to have, not only are you going to have different versions of your, your microservice, right? Your, let's, we'll back up a minute, because deprecation is always a discussion on this. In the Kubernetes and microservices world, when you have a new microservice, you don't, you're not going to copy over the old one. You're going to put a new one out there, right? You're not going to, like now, in today's world, we have a jar file, and we want to update, we copy a new jar file out. It's not going to happen that way. Instead, you're just going to put a new version of a microservice out there. So now you have, multiple, you have microservices that do a certain function or, or uh, some level of reuse, and you have multiple versions of those microservices. And you're sharing those microservices with other application teams who are consuming them. And applications still have versions. Now you understand why I get excited about it since I'm a configuration management geek? Because this is a configuration management puzzle to put together. And as we walk down this road, we're going to be creating this thing that now is, we often call a Death Star that we need to, to track a version. The application still exists, though. And there is a version of it. Your customers, if you're a bank, you're, you're going to have a Teller application, and you're going to have certain individuals who are going to be using certain versions of that application. Microservices may become our new feature flag. You put a new microservice out there, and you route, it, route the new microservice to create a new version of your application to a set of users. Oh, and then this happens. About down on the bottom, if I had a little red thing, linking the application occurs at runtime. And where did it occur before? At build. So the smart guy who was making sure everything was linking correctly and stayed up at, you know, didn't go to the volleyball tournament, he stayed on Friday night to work on the build. That guy's not going to have to do that anymore because it's going to be linked at runtime. So we shifted one of the core development um, chores over to the runtime environment. So this is one I love to talk about, is moving away from waterfall. What I'm hearing from many of the uh, early users of Kubernetes and microservices is this is what the, it looks like. They create um, an environment of a set of clusters 
that has a, that re represents development, then they re-release it in test, and then they re-release it in prod. This is kind of the first level. But service mesh has the potential to change that. And I, this is probably my favorite part of Kubernetes, even though I love the fact that it's fault tolerant and it does high availability. The ability for it to disrupt the waterfall is probably the most exciting part of it, in my, in my personal opinion. Because we've wanted this for so long. I was, you know, I've, I've played on many roles. I've been a developer, I've been a tester, I've worked on networking, I've done operations. And it's always been, you know, you have, a, you have something running in the test environment. All you want is to have, reroute the people that are in production to use it. Now, it's true, you might have to have them um, point to a different database, or there may be some different environment configurations. But Service Mesh has the ability to do what I like to call persona routings. So Service Mesh sits underneath your cluster and decides who gets what version of what microservice, and that determines what, what, where they are in, this, in the life cycle. So you say, route it to my dev team, route it to my test team, route it to my prod team. And I'm hoping that we see uh, Service Mesh start integrating with things like LDAP so that we can do that. Now, as part of that routing, we might have to uh, update one microservice so that database now is pointing to production, but everything else is gonna stay exactly the same and exactly the way we tested it. So um, we created Deploy Hub because of this problem. Um, you know, because I, I come from the build management space, we looked down the road and around the corner and said, what is going to happen when you start linking everything in this production environment? And how do we not make the same problems that we did in object-oriented programming? Object-oriented programming was a brilliant idea and poorly executed. And it was poorly executed because of the way we compiled code. We, always, we never had a proper way of versioning, uh, creating a VPath statement in a build so that we could say, pull the right library for this link step. So it sort of failed. And what we did instead was we started checking in our, our reusable libraries into our own repository, and so it was copied code. It was never object-oriented code, it was object-oriented copied code. Because everybody took their own version so they could pull it into their own repository and they could compile it themselves. It, was a, it, it, was a, it, it became a, a great idea that was just had a bad implementation. Well, we're here again. Microservices is basically object-oriented, and the idea of what we call um, domain-driven design is gonna become uh, important. Now, we don't want, this is Netflix showed uh, yesterday, and they talked about, they had, I can't remember, they did 40,000, did anybody go to that? I think he said 40,000 uh, releases a day. Um, this you can pull right off of Google. It was too big for me to actually include as the whole thing. They call this the, the Netflix Death Star. It is all of their microservices running. Now, Netflix is a pretty big company, and they probably can have um, clusters out there that may not be used, but not everybody can do that. Uh, and he talked a little bit about how they, try to, they, they work on deprecating. But what we're hearing are new terms like haunted graveyards, which is a cluster that are of services that you don't know who's using them, so you don't want to kill, kill them off because it might come back to haunt you. Or a Frankenstein cluster, one that just keeps giving, getting bigger and bigger and bigger and you don't know who actually is consuming it. And the question we, I always get anytime I do, a, um, a, whether it be a webinar or I'm talking to people, is how do we figure out how to deprecate? And that probably is, that is the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the million dollar question. So if you think about what a, your, if, to solve the problem, we have to, to solve this problem, we have to figure out what the logical view of the application is and who's, where the consumption is. So in this case, in our hipster store, I have an example here where the product catalog, the payment uh, microservices, the checkout, and the ad um, microservice all changed, and there are two versions of the hipster store running in production at the same time, and they're both consuming different, ca uh, different services, different versions of the services. Now, in our service mesh world, this could mean it looks like this, and, and the second release out there is testing, and the first release is production, and we might have a third one if we add another change to the, the checkout uh, module, and that checkout module uh, service may be updated by a different team. So we may have a team that does nothing but work on the checkout uh, pieces, 
could just be two people, <laughs> and they make a fix to it, your application has to be aware of that fix and, and decide if you're going to start using the new one, and then you update your YAML file to tell Kubernetes what you want it to do. And there are lots of little pieces. Even though this technology is really, really awesome, it's still difficult. Um, coming from the open source world, there's starting to be investment into this space. There's starting to be tools that set on top of these, uh, these, the Kubernetes data center environment to make it simpler. But it's still complex. And every single service has its own environment variable pieces, like Lambda or Red Hat operators or Ansible or Helm charts that decide how you did the install. The instructions of how it gets updated into your container, how it's going to talk to the Kubernetes cluster, how many times it can replicate itself. All of that is part now of your application because it's part of the definition of the service and the service is part of the application. So if you change one of those, you have a new version of your application. And you need to have that information, otherwise it's going to be, get difficult. So finding and sharing. If somebody creates a new version of the catalog piece or the ad piece, how do we tell each other about it? Now, in, the, um, in microservices.io um, by Chris Richardson, there's a really nice description of the domain-driven design and cataloging. So if it's out there, how do we find it? And how do we get collaboration across the silos? So when you talk about domain-driven design, you're talking about, I, I like to compare it to like a music sharing service. Let's say you create a music list, and it's your favorite list. Um, and then there is a new version of one of the songs in that list that came out, and it sounds a lot better because they corrected the, uh, the, the production of it. You need to know that that better sounding sound is out there and to add it to your, your list. Also, if you're going to create a list, it's kind of nice to be able to say, I would like to have some jazz. I might like to have some bluegrass. I might like to have some country. And if they weren't categorized in those kinds of genres, it would be really hard to find them. I could hardly ever remember the name of an album or a, a song, but I can Google it and put some words and I remember, you know, <laughs> breathless and it'll come up. We can't do that necessarily with microservices in our Death Star. So a domain-driven design will be essential as you start building out this solution. And in that domain-driven design, you can build it out where it's, you, you think of it about it in a hierarchical format, like base services, which might be security, which might be, in our case, the payment section. And then you have, and oftentimes I've seen it described like in a pyramid, where at the bottom level are the most common microservices that the, an application uses, and at the highest level is the application-specific uh, uh, microservices. This requires a discussion within your organization of how that domain-driven design is going to look. Because if every team just goes out and starts writing microservices and you don't have a way to organize them, it's going to be like trying to find a song and a, and a music sharing service that doesn't have uh, it organized by artists and genres and album name. I am, yes. You see, you get the problem too. You know, if you look at it, what's happening from a configuration standpoint, you begin understanding the challenge we have in changing our pipeline because our pipeline should handle this. Our pipeline should, we should be adding processes and tools in that really handles it. If a new configure, if a new, um, a new service comes along, there should be a, part, a piece in our pipeline that makes sure that we're organizing it in some way and it is based on a repository. However it's being done, doesn't matter. But it has to have, be a discussion and it has to be organized. So just a few of my uh, predictions. Um, a few workflows and repo repositories will change to potentially hundreds. Now, many of you already have hundreds, so it could change to thousands. Um, microservice configuration mapping will represent a logical view of the application. So you, it won't be, you, won't, you will never have an application again. You only have a logical view of it. It's, will be, it's not going to be something physical. Um, the waterfall environment is going to probably become a single environment with service mesh. Um, that one, anytime I talk about it, people are, are all nod their head and say, yes, this is what we'd like to do. And cataloging and sharing will become key across the pipelines. So I'm hoping you can take these thoughts home, these four thoughts. 
And as you start moving into microservices, you pursue them. Um, I don't think that I put it in this, but there was an article in SD Times. Um, I think the company name that they interviewed was called Segment. And they moved to microservices, 100% microservices. And then they were interviewed because they went back to monolithic. And she wrote, she, she was quoted and the sentence was crazy and she said something like this. She said, at first we, we, we implemented uh, our microservices in our application and then we had a new version of the microservice and new applications started using the new version of the microservice. So then we started trying to track what applications were using what microservices and then we decided to go back to monolithic. <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I have on your, t your, your um, uh, seats, there's some around, uh, I'm gonna give out two uh, Starbucks gift cards. So there's some more up here if anybody needs one. And while you're filling that out, I'll take some questions and then you can run to lunch because I know that I'm standing in between you and food. And also come see me at the CD Foundation booth. It's right over kind of in the middle. Um, we were by the popcorn last night. Sure.